video 26 of the master course quantum chemistry of molecular electromagnetic properties the topic of this lecture is definition of electric properties and electric multipole expansion in the first part of the book we have derived extra terms in the hamiltonian of a system which describe the interaction of molecules with external or internal electromagnetic fields. And in the second part of this first part, we have looked at perturbation theory, or we have used perturbation theory, in order to derive corrections to the energy of a system due to the interaction of the system with electromagnetic fields and to for example, a dipole moment to, in general, an expectation value by using response theory. Now, in the second part of the book, we will discuss uh, several properties of molecules, time independent and time dependent molecular properties, and derive quantum mechanical expressions for them using the perturbation theory expressions for, for the energy and for response functions, which we had derived in the first part of the book. Some of these properties which we are going to discuss are, are well known from uh, pre-quantum mechanical physics or chemistry, like for example, a dipole moment, electric dipole moment of a distribution of uh, positive and negative charges, or the magnetic dipole moment in the case of rotating charges. For these uh, kind of properties, we will start with the classical expressions and then translate them to quantum mechanic expression. But there also will be properties uh, where there is no classical analog and where we will derive them directly from quantum mechanical expressions. As the first example, let's look at the electrostatic potential outside of a molecule. Now, the electric charges made in a molecule, the charges from the nuclei, positive charges and the negative charges uh, from the electrons, of course, give rise to an electric field. And a way to represent that field is to represent it by the associated electrostatic potential, which is a field, meaning that it has different values at different points in space. Now, other molecules in the neighborhood of the molecule we're looking at will, of course, experience this field and react to this field, which is another way of saying that there are long-range interactions between the molecules. Now, let's look now at the continuous distribution of charges with the charge density, rho, as a function of a point in space. And then the definition of the electrostatic potential from such a charge distribution is given here, where we look at the electrostatic potential at an observation point capital R. And this is then given as an integral over our charge distribution divided by the distance between the, the norm of the distance of this between our observation point and our uh, integration point, because we have to integrate over whole space. And this one over four pi epsilon zero is there for the units. This uh, expression is exact, but it's not particularly useful because I have to evaluate this integral for every observation point again. So if I sort of want to map the electrostatic potential outside of a molecule, I would have to carry out this integration many times for every observation point. Secondly, in order to do that, I need to know exactly the charge distribution in principle over whole space, but uh, in practice over the area of the, of the molecule. What we'll do now in the following uh, slides to derive an alternative expression for the electrostatic potential, which requires neither this integration over space all the time, nor uh, requires it exact knowledge of the charge distribution. We will arrive at this by, in the first place, expanding here the denominator 
in our expression for the electrostatic potential in a Taylor series. A Taylor series around some origin R0, which is, uh, let's place it inside of the charge distribution. So a normal Taylor expansion around origin means, I mean, R is the variable. So um, in the first term, I get now the distance between our observation point and this origin. And then I get uh, derivatives of my function multiplied the distance between the variable and the expansion point, what I call the origin. And since we are in three-dimensional space, I have to sum over all components here of the vectors. So you have the first derivative multiplied with this step away from the origin plus one half of the second derivative here with um, a product twice this step. And since, uh, as I said, vectors, I have now a double sum over Cartesian components. So alpha and here alpha and beta can be, uh, I will sum over x, y, and z. If we now insert this expansion of one over r, capital R minus uh, small r, in the expression for the electrostatic potential, which I've written up here again. So I insert it in here underneath the integral. Uh, and then, of course, I can take all the terms out of the integral, which are constant, which don't depend on little r anymore. And that's obviously the first term here. So I've taken it out here. But also all the derivatives I can take out because I have to evaluate the derivatives at this origin, at my expansion point which means they are uh, not going to be dependent on r anymore, on cap, on small r anymore, which is the variable for the integration here. So I can take them out and look at the first three terms. I then get here from the first term in the expansion, I get just this one over the distance between my observation point and the origin times the integral over the charge density. The next I have here the first derivative again, and now I have an integral over my charge density multiplied here with this step length, the step away from my origin to the uh, to the point R. And here the second term I have um, the second derivative, and I have again here the charge density multiplied now with twice of these steps. Now these integrals, these integrals over the charge density, and then increasing powers of this step away from my um, expansion point, from my origin. These kind of integrals where I have a function, and then I multiply the function with powers of my variable of the function. These are called the nth order moments of that function, which means those integrals here are the moments of the charge distribution, or called electric moments. And the, the zeroth moment, where n is equal to zero, this is the integral over the charge distribution, and of course that is the total charge of my system. The next one, the first moment, where, where n is equal to one, is this one here, that's called the first electric moment, first electric moment, or normally called the electric dipole moment because it actually is the expression for a dipole moment. This next one is then called the second electric moment and so forth. Now, if you would know the value of the charge, the value of this first electric moment, dipole moment, the value of this second electric moment and so forth for our molecule, meaning for our charge distribution, then we can replace the integrals, these integrals, by these moments in our expansion of the electrostatic potential, as I've done here. So this is my expression for the expansion of the electrostatic potential, which comes from the expression of the, or the expansion of one over capital R minus small r. And here I had, I mean, here in the first term, I had the integral of the charge distribution, whereas where I now just write the total charge in the second term, I had the integral where I had the charge distribution multiplied with, with r, meaning the first moment. So I just write here the uh, first electric moment or the dipole moment of my molecule. And in the next term, 
I write the second elective moment. gives us this expression and the second derivative gives us that expression. And by doing that, I have what is called the multipole expansion of the electrostatic potential. Because I mean it's an expansion of the electrostatic potential. And in the individual terms of this expansions, expansion, I have now the different multipole moments of my charge distribution. Here the first moment and here the second moment and so forth. And as you can see, this expansion now fulfills sort of the goal we wanted to achieve because we can now evaluate the electrostatic potential for every observation point capital R without having to carry out any integrations. Um, the only thing, of course, we need to know, we need to know what the charge is, we need to know what the first uh, moment of our charge distribution is, the, the electric dipole moment, and we need to know the second electric moment, and so forth. But the other terms here we can immediately calculate um, because we only need to know what we've chosen as the expansion point or origin here and then we can evaluate that uh, without much effort for every observation point R. When we look at the expression for those moments you can see that they in principle all depend on this expansion point R. O, also called the origin. However, I can show that the first moment, the first non-vanishing moment, is actually independent of this origin. But all higher moments, they will depend on this origin, which means that if, for example, we look at the dipole moment of a neutral molecule, then the expression for the dipole moment of a neutral molecule this type of moment will be independent of the origin. Or if you have a neutral and unpolar molecule, meaning a molecule which has no charge, no total charge, and has no electric dipole moment, then also the second order moment will be independent of this origin arm. But for all the other systems, the moment will depend. For example, if you have a char an ion, a charged molecule, then already the dipole moment of that molecule depends on the origin. And the quadrupole mo mo moment, the second electric moment of a neutral but polar molecule, polar meaning it has a dipole moment, will also depend on this origin. A second thing is that um, instead of talking about the second electric moment, Q, one often talks about a quadrupole moment tensor, or the quadrupole moment, um, in particular this traceless quadrupole moment tensor, which only has five independent elements, and which is defined in this way here. It is essentially a rewriting of the expression for the second electric moment. And you can see that um, if you try to add them if you take the diagonal elements, so theta xx plus theta yy plus theta zz, the sum of those is zero and that therefore it's called the traceless quadrupole moment tensor. And the information, the physical information which is hidden in this or which this um, tensor has is that it measures the deviation of the charge distribution from a spherical symmetry. So we distinguish between Q, the one which we had defined on the slide before, which is the second electric moment, and theta here, which is the electric quadrupole moment. 